the the Lord's been getting on me about uh, demonstrating more. You'll probably hear me say this a lot, but um, whenever whenever Jesus preached the kingdom of God, he didn't just use words. He he demonstrated the nearness of the kingdom of God. Sometimes it was through um, prophetic words, like what we what we just did here. Sometimes it was through deliverance. Sometimes it was through healing. Um, and I figure. Uh, if Jesus did it that way, I probably don't have a right to reinvent the wheel. Yeah? So uh, just to give you some context for what that was, there's scripture talks about a, a gift of the Holy Spirit called the gift of prophecy, where uh, the Lord gives you words for somebody else to encourage, exhort, build them up. Um, there's, depending on the church context that you came from, that can you know, using the word prophecy can feel like really spooky. Sometimes if you're in a really unhealthy environment, you can associate that with manipulation. Um, the misuse of something is not the reason to negate the use of something altogether. So we're, what we want to do here, and even what I believe the Lord's doing and having me share some of this, is he wants to give us all a context for like, there's healthy, encouraging ways for all of this stuff to work. Um, and to... Some of you Office fans will uh, know what I'm... Put it this way. You, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott. Um, so we can be in a church... And I wasn't planning on talking about this. We can be in a church culture that talks about the gifts and says we believe in the, the movement of the Holy Spirit and the power of God to speak and heal and do all this stuff. But if we never actually like step out to meet him there, um, we're not going to see it happen, yeah. at least very rarely. Um, God can still do what he wants, and, not but, and, uh, he, the, the whole, the, the totality of this book is him partnering with humanity to release his will and his kingdom on the earth. So it's all of us going on this journey together, amen? Yeah. Um, one more thing that I wanted to pray for, um, and then we'll move forward with some stuff that I think the Lord wants to say. Um, driving over here this morning, I had a really strong impression that there's a, somebody in here, probably a couple people, you've got some sort of injury to your right rotator cuff, um, and I believe that the Lord wants to heal you. There's, Hallelujah. amen. <laughs> um, so could you stand up, and who else is it? There, it can be more than one person. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, church, if you see somebody standing, there's people kind of all over. Can you put a hand on them? Um, and we're going to pray. And how many of you guys know that when Jesus prayed for the sick, he didn't use, uh, put it this way, he didn't beg God to do anything. He didn't say, dear Lord, Je like, like, dear Lord, if it's, if it's your will, could you please, would you maybe consider, might you? Um, he, he spoke to the issue and commanded it to move. Scripture tells us that we're actually seated with Jesus in heavenly places. That speaks to us sharing in his authority. So when we pray for the sick, uh, maybe do it the way he did it. He seems to have a pretty good track record. So maybe do it the way he did it. So I'm just going to pray, uh, and you can agree with me. So Father, right now in Jesus' name, we break trauma off of these bodies. We speak to uh, the muscles in the rotator cuff, and we command them to be made whole, that cartilage would be restored, pain would go, mobility would be restored in Jesus' name. We command all pain to leave now, and we release healing in the name of Jesus. Your word says, by your stripes we're healed, so we stand in what your blood and your stripes paid for, and we say in Jesus' name, shoulders be healed now. In Jesus' name. All right, so for those of you who are receiving prayer, can you try moving your shoulder around and see how we're feeling? All right. So who's, you, after testing it out, who would say you're about 80% better? Just lift a hand and kind of wave it at me. 80, 80, 80. 80, awesome. So stay, so stay standing because we're going to keep praying for you. God tends to finish what he starts, yeah? So Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We bless this and we say in the name of Jesus, 100%.
all pain, all stiffness, all of it be done, 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 done. In Jesus' name, all pain go, mobility be restored in the name of Jesus. All right, moving around again. Let's see how we're doing. All right, who's at 100? We got 100. Keep moving it around. Who's got 100%? Just wave your hand at me so that everybody can see. We want people to be able to know what God's doing. She's a little bit in shock over here, so <laughs> she's just kind of laughing. All right, so who's maybe not at 100, but you're still sort of around 80? Wave it really high. This isn't just for me. It's so that people around you can see that God's doing something. So thank you, Jesus. Uh, we're going to pray one more time, and then we're going to continue to move from here. So Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for 100%. Um, you want to go find somebody to put your hand on? So Father, we thank you for 100%. And we just speak healing, healing, healing. God, we thank you that this isn't anything uh, about us, but you, you told us to lay hands on the sick so that they would recover. So we're just doing what you told us to do. So in Jesus' name, pain go, shoulder be restored. Um, and specifically, God, for the, for the ones where there was, I'm seeing a picture of, it's like you slammed into something with your shoulder and it messed it up. For, so for whoever that is, we just say in Jesus' name, all the trauma from that accident, go. Um, and for whoever it is that's still, it's like an old football injury, whoever that is. God, we just say in Jesus' name, healing come, pain go. All right, last time, move it around again for us. All right, who else is at 100? Anybody else at 100%? That's number two. Number three. Number four. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. When God shows up and heals people. <laughs> I particularly like it. Uh, I particularly love seeing the faces on people when they like, weren't expecting it to happen and then it happens. That, that look of like shock is, I could, I could live off of that. <laughs> so for some of you that might have been really new, uh, might have made you a little uncomfortable, that's okay. Um, but just to, again, give context, uh, when Jesus shows up, Jesus brings healing. So yes, can we agree with that? So one of the things, and this is one way to look at the gifts that I've found really helpful. Um, the, the kingdom of God coming, which scripture talks about, that's one of the things that happens with Jesus, that happens with Christmas. The, the advent of Jesus is the advent of the kingdom of God breaking into the earth. Part of what that looks like is the, the restoration of creation. If you cheat and read the end of the book... <laughs> Uh, you'll, you'll see that there's this moment where heaven and earth are no longer separate, but they're, like, they're, they're coming together and they're one. That's what scripture talks about with the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, uh, like a bride uh, adorned for her husband. And then we hear, uh, John hears this phrase rather, uh, and there will be no more tears. Uh, and there's, there's this moment where everything that's been wrong with creation gets made right. So that includes uh, not just emotional healing, it does include that, but it's not just emotional healing, it's physical healing. How many of you guys know that when God made Adam and Eve, he gave them bodies and told them that their, their bodies were good? So part of what we believe as Christians isn't just that when we, when we die and go to heaven, we're going to have this disembodied experience living and, you know, sitting like fat cherubs on a cloud and playing a harp all day. Part of what our hope is, and I'm going to talk about hope here in a minute, our hope is that Jesus is actually coming back to restore everything that was broken with the fall. And that includes our bodies. 
So when Jesus comes and when the kingdom comes near and begins to heal bodies, it's a sign. Again, signs point to something. It's a sign pointing to the reality. Jesus was who he said he was. The kingdom of God is coming in an even fuller measure, and it's pointing to the reality that, that God's coming back and is going to make everything new. All right? I can tell this is a new thought for some of you guys. Uh, if it's messing up your theology a little bit or your way of thinking, you're welcome. Uh, I put it this way. Um, I, I had a moment in college during my studies where, and I, my degrees in Bible and theology, and I was walking in between classes and the Lord uh, said this really clearly. And he said, Aaron, if you study theology just to be right, then that's all, you, that's all you'll get. If you study to know me, then you get me. So sometimes we, we think we come to church just so that we can have the final answer on something and move on. Like I've solved the puzzle and I get to move on from that. Uh, I, I would propose to you that that's not how any relationship works. Uh, as a matter of fact, my wife gets very upset at me when I act like I have her figured out. Uh, those of you who are married know exactly what I'm talking about. So if we're talking about actually being in a relationship with Jesus, and by the way, he, who he is is infinite, like it has no end, you're not going to get to a point where you figure him out. So part of what even healing and, and moments like this and even study, like all of this does is it, the, the Holy Spirit is our teacher, right? Right. So there are these moments where he shows us something new. Uh, scripture calls the wisdom of God multifaceted. So facets are sort of like a diamond, yeah? So if you hold a diamond up to the light and you start to twist it, you're going to see things that you didn't see and you could only see from having turned it to that angle. So I would propose to you that, that part of the good news of being in a relationship with Jesus is that the more you look at him, the more you engage with scripture, the more that you worship, the more that you pray, it's not just you going over the same thing over and over and over again, but there's actually a deepening and a turning of that diamond and you get to see a new facet, a new piece of who he is. And part of that process is you getting uncomfortable. Like you're, you're going to think like, no, nope, I've got this pretty buttoned down and then God twists it on you. And it's like, but did you consider this. Basically, if any of you get too comfortable, I'm not doing my job right. <laughs> okay. So Holy Spirit, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for showing up already. Thank you for healing. Um, help me. Amen. <laughs> so I am going to spend some time talking about Mary today. Those of you who uh, brought your Bibles, which technically all of you did because most of you have smartphones, uh, go ahead and turn to Luke 1. Um, and even before I jump into that, what I'm about to talk about is going to tie into that. But it's something that the Lord's just kind of been speaking to me about in the past couple of weeks. So to give you a little context, um, I believe I mentioned it last time I spoke, but my grandfather uh, currently, uh, he's been diagnosed with cancer and it's progressing pretty rapidly. Um, and I've been walking through just the grief, the frustration, the pain, everything that comes with that. And simultaneously, things have been going really well. Uh, you can actually have both things happening at the same time. So let that set you free. Um, but with that, I, I've, I've prayed for people with cancer before and I've seen them healed. That's nothing amazing about me. It's just that Jesus actually is who he says he is. So I'm kind of having this dialogue with the Lord where it's like, Lord, what is it about, like most of us who've been praying for the sick for a while or even are part of church traditions that believe that God still heals miraculously, like we, we believe God can do a lot, but there's certain things, certain diseases, certain words that get said and it feels like it sucks all the air out of the room, right? Like cancer is one of those. You say that word and all of a sudden everybody's like, and I'm, I'm like, God, what is that? And he actually took me to Hebrews 11. So keep your, keep your place in Luke 1, but we're going to talk about Hebrews 11. And I'm going to actually read that for us really quick. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith 
is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. If you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard that quoted quite a bit. And, you know, familiarity breeds contempt is the phrase, right? We are so familiar with it, we don't stop to think about it. Now, part of what is actually going on here in the, in the original language is there's actually a ton of like force and concreteness that's being established. So faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see in the NIV. That, that word confidence or proof, or let me pull it back up again in the CSB, it, faith is the reality of what is hoped for. That word is, uh, for those of you Greek loving nerds in here, uh, is the word hypostasis. Now, why do you tell me that? Why do you care? Because that's actually a word that's very important in Christian tradition. If you've studied uh, anything about the nature of Jesus, the fact that Jesus is God, the, one of the words that was used to sort of you know, describe the best way that we could about like how does, how does a man, how is Jesus fully man and fully God? And the word that gets used is en, like en hypostasis. So the, the same word for nature, Jesus having a fully human nature and a fully divine nature. It's not a combination of the two. It's not 50-50. It's not one more than the other. Like that's the word that's getting used. So, and track with me, I'm, I'm taking us full circle here. Faith is the hypostasis of what we hope for. So faith is the thing that puts flesh on our hope. Faith is the thing that makes real what we hope for. So just to tie it into what I've been talking about in terms of, you know, cancer, praying for the sick. Faith is not the only thing, but it is a thing. This is the best way that I have to put it. There's plenty of moments in scripture where Jesus just shows up, heals people, and there's moments in scripture where he looks to them and says, your faith has made you well. So when it comes to specifically just the conversation I was having with the Lord about things like cancer, uh, there are certain diseases and certain problems that we've trained ourselves to not have hope in. Because we don't, we so don't want to get disappointed that we've decided it's safer to partner with hopelessness than to stand in hope and actually believe and then act in faith with what hope says. And this is true for life in general. It doesn't just have to be healing. And one of the things that we tend to do is we so want to oftentimes, and I think so much of this happens subconsciously, we so want to skip over where our hearts are at in the middle of something. We so don't want to even take a gauge for where our hope is at that we'll try to use faith as sort of this like baton to beat ourselves into, you know, into where we think we should be. We try to drum ourselves up like, no, I'm going to stand in faith. I'm going to do this. All the while, what you're really doing internally is you're using that as a way to not look at the fact that you are in pain. You're not using it to look at the, the fact that you're struggling with your hope. And in doing that, so scripture says without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? Then that means that hope is actually very integrally tied into our ability to move in faith and please God. Are we tracking? So hopelessness then is something we have to partner with the Lord to kill in us. And you can turn back to Luke 1. This is going to lead into more of what I'm talking about today. Hope is the thing that actually positions you to be ready to move when God says move. I'm going to read from Luke 1, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. 
but she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting could this be? Then the angel told her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. Verse 34, Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have not had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. I'm going to skip down to verse 46. What happens in those in-between verses is just that Mary does what the angel said, basically, and goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And upon meeting Elizabeth, you know, basically by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, calls out, oh, you're pregnant and the Lord's doing something. And then Mary responds. And Mary said, my soul praises the greatness of the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed because the mighty one has done great things for me and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. So there's a lot of, that was a big chunk of scripture, number one. Thank you for staying engaged. Uh, and there's, there's a step there. I need to remember that. <laughs> I gave a few of you a heart attack. <laughs> So there's a lot of context going on that's leading up to this moment. And that's why I even went further and read uh, Mary's hymn of praise there, because it hints at this. The, put it this way, the, the song, Mary, Did You Know, that we're all starting to hear come on the radio, uh, the answer is yes, Mary did know. You can stop asking the question, she did know. <laughs> Mary, did you know that your baby boy, yes, that's why the angel said, and he will sit on the throne of his father, David. So what the angel is telling Mary isn't just, hey, this miraculous thing's going to happen and you're going to have a baby without, you know, any human intervention. It's saying, it's saying not only that, but this is actually going to be the Messiah that Israel's been waiting for for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. And we see that exploding off of the page in Mary's heart when she's praising the Lord spontaneously in that moment because it's talking about all these themes of God hasn't forgotten his promise. He hasn't forgotten the promises he made to Abraham and his descendants. He hasn't forgotten me, meek and lowly me. He hasn't forgotten me. And why, how, how does this all tie into hope? And how does that hope position you to respond to the Lord when he comes knocking? So part of what's going on in Luke 1, we don't have time to read through the whole thing, though I would encourage you, please do read it, uh, is Mary's story is happening at the same time as her cousin Elizabeth's story. And if you notice as you're reading through, there's a lot of similarities. Gabriel is visiting both of the parents. So Gabriel's going to uh, Elizabeth's husband and Gabriel's also going to Mary. They both have these hymns of praise that they release you know, at different points in the narrative. So the, the author is really trying to help you see like there's some similarities going on here. But the differences in the midst of those similarities give us a clue to how hope, you know, how hope affects our hearts when the Lord comes. So if you actually look at the story of Elizabeth's husband, he's a priest, he's serving. And then Gabriel comes to him and says, hey, your wife is actually going to become pregnant and you're going to bear a son. This is what his name's going to be, the whole deal. And instead of 
we see that the responses between both Mary and Elizabeth's husband are very different. Elizabeth's husband, his first thing is to come with all of the reasons why it can't possibly work. Do you know how old me and my wife are? We're not, things don't work the way they used to. Like, th this can't happen. And the angel's response to that is essentially, if that's how you're going to speak over what God's doing, I'm actually going to make you mute until it's time to name your son. And then you compare and contrast that with Mary's response. She does have the question, it's like, what, is, what do you mean, blessed and highly favored? And also, practical question, um, I'm not married and I haven't had relations with anybody. How is this going to work? Angel gives her an answer and then her response is, be it unto me according to your word. And the difference there, I would say, is hope. The difference there is that Zechariah's understanding or his heart was even in such this, it was in this place of like, yes, I believe the Messiah is going to come. Yes, I believe God can do miraculous things. I mean, I tell myself and my kids the story of Abraham and, and Sarah all the time. But his response reveals the condition of his heart. His response reveals he's more preoccupied with what he believes to be possible than what God is saying he's going to do in and through him. Versus Mary, and again, that's why I read through the Magnificat, which is just the old Latin name for Mary's hymn of praise there. Uh, Mary's response, all the stuff that's going on in her heart is coming out in this moment, and she's talking about this God who's faithful to the lowly, who fulfills all of his promises, who hasn't forgotten Israel. So her heart is firmly grounded in this hope that God's actually going to do what he said he was going to do. Her heart is firmly grounded in the, in the hope that God's going to bring the Messiah that Israel's been waiting for. And I'll put it this way too. You can even know the health and condition of your hope based on how much you think you get in the way. Put it another way. Scripture uses a lot of comparing and contrasting, right? Do you, do you notice that ev basically every single time throughout Scripture, when God comes to somebody and says, like, hey, you're going to be a deliverer, this is what I'm going to do through you, when they come with their objections about how insignificant they are, God doesn't give them a pat on the head and say, you're right, thank you for being humble, but I'm still going to do this. He rebukes them. When he comes to Moses, and Moses is like, ah, I'm not a good speaker, I've got a stutter, they're not going to want, want to have anything to do with me, I killed you know, this guy and made their lives more difficult. God doesn't say, you know, you're right, but I'm so awesome and you're so small and you know, all this stuff. He says, who made man's mouth? Who are you to tell me what I can and cannot do through you? Same thing when it comes to Zechariah. The angel is essentially saying, yes, all that is true. I, I am, God is fully aware of how old you are. He doesn't need to be reminded. He gets a rebuke. Mary is one of the first few people in scripture to hear it and just say, be it unto me according to your word. And what's the, another thing that I want to draw our attention to, you know, we, in Christian culture, we talk a lot about, you know, following the will of God, you know, what's the call of God on my life, all of this stuff. And, and we sort of romanticize it. Some even go so far as to say we sort of worship the idea of calling. We, we put all of our, our hope, all of our thoughts about whether or not we're going to be okay in this idea of like, I need to find my calling and I need to, you know, operate in that which number one just speaks to an identity crisis that we're having. Um, your, your calling is, and your assignment is not going to exist in heaven. You're, you, you, can be, you can have what we would consider a big calling. You can be a prophet. You can be an apostle. This side of heaven, you're not taking that with you. So if we're running after that, it speaks to an identity issue that we have. 
that's another sermon. <laughs> but we, man, we, we try so hard as soon as we get that word or that prompting, we try so hard to make it happen for ourselves. In another compare and contrast moment, that's exactly what Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar did. They, they got the word, they received it, they're like, cool, but I have to make this happen and it's going to be in a way that makes sense to me. So Hagar, let's get you pregnant and that's probably going to be the, the chosen line that, that, the, that God's talking about. God comes back and says, no, that's not what I said. There's an element of call, like when, you, when God comes to you and calls you to something, there's an element of surrender. And that's what we see in the heart of Mary. It's a deep surrender. Because to remind you, this woman is unmarried and has never been married. So part of what the angel's actually saying to her is like, hey, God's going to bless you and you're going to be the one who brings the Messiah into the world. And part of what's going on contextually is, and you're not married and you're not getting married anytime soon. You're going to have to bear the, the cultural questions and shame of, oh, the Holy Spirit overshadowed you. Sure. I'm sure that's exactly what happened. And Mary knows what she's saying yes to when she says, be it unto me according to your word. So many of times we, we reach for the call of God and we don't recognize that there's a cost associated with it. And here's another element to think about. We, we reach for the call of God. We say, you know, God, what's my calling? What's my gifting? All of this. Um, and... and We've gotten so wrapped up in the like, I need to find personal fulfillment around like what God's asking me to do. Like that's when I'm finally going to be happy, which again is a whole other sermon. But we get, we get so wrapped up in it that we make our calling about us. Because again, a Mary is steeped in the story that God's telling through Israel. He, she's steeped in this. Like, that's where her hope is. So while she looks and sees and recognizes the cost that she's going to have to pay of bearing shame, questions, slurs, all of this stuff for the full nine months that this baby is developing in her womb, and even after that, she's gonna, she knows what she is saying yes to. The other thing that's going on in her heart and in her head is, Am I really going to say no to this and cut my people off from the Messiah coming into the world? She recognizes that what God's asking her to do is about way more than just her. Do you recognize that the surrender that the Lord's asking you for, even if you might not be able to see it right now, is actually about more than just you. Now, depending on where you're at inside of yourself, whether you, and this isn't to throw shame on anybody, but whether you're at a spot in yourself, whether you're, where you're leaning more towards like a victim mentality versus a son or a daughter mentality, if you lean more towards victim, you hear that and you're like, man, that's a ton of weight. Why would God do that to me? Why would he put that on me? But that's actually something to empower you. Because you're, you're right, it is hard. Like you, we count the cost. God's saying, hey, I want you to do this. And he knows what he's asking us to give up. But when you understand that it's not just about you and it's not just about the pain and the shame that you might experience and it's not just about the questions that people are gonna have and it's not about the fact that they're not gonna understand you saying yes to what God's asked you to do, when you understand it's bigger than that, and when you understand that, you know, there's my family line on the other side of my obedience. There's people on the other side of my obedience who are going to meet Jesus. There's people getting healed on the other side of my obedience, on the other side of my surrender. When you understand that and you get that in view, your yes actually becomes a lot simpler and it becomes a lot easier. The 
you'll hear me talk about it a lot, but this is just me sharing my life with you guys. When the Lord asked me and my family to go join YWAM back at like end of 2019, early 2020, we were on staff here. We were doing okay. We had our friends. We had our family. Ministry was going well. Jobs were going well. And the Lord interrupts all of that and says, hey, I need you to, I need you to go and get ready to live like a missionary and raise support for yourself. We had just had a kid. Jacob, our youngest, was about a year old when we left. And we're leaving our, our support system. We're leaving the church family that we've been a part of for about a decade at this point. We're leaving all of that behind. And, you know, part of what we're wrestling with is God. We, like, it's, it's really good here. I, I, and we know that you're asking us to go, but like, what's this about? And if, I had, if we had just stayed in that spot of, you know, this is just about us and like what's comfortable for us, what's about us, it would have been really easy to say like, please find somebody else. But when you expand the, the scope of that, even not even just to the people that we were thinking we were going to be able to reach at that time, when you expand the scope of it to my son is going to grow up seeing parents that say yes to Jesus even when it doesn't make sense. That made that decision a thousand times easier. And I'll say this. You surrendering to the call of God also means you surrendering your right to know how things are going to play out. Mary thought she, to some extent, she, she had an idea of how this whole Messiah thing was going to play out. It very obviously didn't play out how they all thought it was going to play out. But her surrender to the Lord in that moment, allowed, like literally the, the one that we worship, Jesus, to come into the earth. And even to tie it back to my own story that I was just talking about, I would not, I can say with full confidence, I would not be ready in any way, shape, or form to be doing what I'm doing right now, pastoring here, leading. I would not be ready to be doing that if I didn't say yes to God's call to go. And let me kind of poke this thing. Let me stoke the flames of hope in you for a minute. What God's doing through your surrender is better than your even, even your best imagined outcome. It's better than you could possibly imagine it turning out. We turned over a staff position here. We turned over jobs. We turned over some of our community. And when we came back, we got, to be very practical, we got connected with Eric Waterbury, who's my spiritual father now. We got grafted into a community and we are so close to each other. We're vulnerable with one another. We're going after the presence of God together. I, I left for a moment, but when I came back, God gave me a community that's so deep and I wouldn't trade for anything. That comes from surrender, and your ability to surrender is tied to how you steward your heart in hope. And that's what Mary did. So if you guys want to stand, I'm going to pray. So Holy Spirit, we just welcome you. We thank you that you're here. So some of you, probably what's running through your head is uh, you're remembering the times that you didn't surrender or you're even feeling 
the, the tug of war that's going on in your own soul around. I, I want to surrender and say yes to what God's asking me to do, but I'm also feeling the desire to like clamp down and try to control things. This is a moment for you to respond. And, and for some of you, for some of you, it's a past thing. For some of you, it's a present thing. Some of you, like you've got the decision in front of you right now. I, I know what God's asking me to do. I know what he's asking me to surrender to. I need grace and I need strength to do it. And for some of you, and this is something that I definitely want to touch on, um, you're, you're recognizing where your hope has faded and you've come into agreement with hopelessness. One way to be able to gauge whether or not your heart is in hopelessness is when was the last time you, you got excited about what the Lord was doing in an area of your life? So I wanna take a moment to just pray over us, kind of covering those different things. Can you just put yourself in a position to receive, whether that's, you know, humbling and kneeling, whether that's holding your hands out, whatever that is, but we, I just want to pray for you and have us pray together. So Father, we, we come before you and we just ask, Holy Spirit, give us hearts like Mary. Father, would you restore and revive hope in us? Jesus, would you forgive us for where we've allowed our hearts and our hope to grow cold? Would you forgive us for where we've stationed our hope in something other than you? Jesus, would you give us the perspective? God, would the, would the eyes of our hearts be flooded with light so that we could see who you are and what you're doing in what's in front of us? Jesus, would you build in us that heart of surrender, the heart that sees everything you're asking us to do, counts the cost and still says, be it unto me according to your word. Jesus, show us how to live that out, how to be practical about it. This one I wanna call out um, specifically. How many of you guys, you've identified an area of your life that you've given into hopelessness over? Just lift a hand at me. We're going to pray for you. So if you see somebody with their hand lifted, just go ahead and put a hand on their shoulder. <laughs> so I'm going to, we're going to pray for you guys. Take a moment to just be with you, lay hands on you. But what I want you to do while we're praying is have a dialogue with Holy Spirit about where, where did I actually give in to hopelessness? Where did that slip in? And then allow him to minister to your heart over that. So Father, right now in Jesus' name, Father, we, we actually repent for where we've chosen hopelessness over the hope that you've called us to. And Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come and breathe life back into hope. Breathe life back into hope. Breathe life back into our hearts. Jesus, you, you're the God who can cause 60 and 70 year old couples to get pregnant. You're the God who can cause a virgin to become pregnant with the savior of the world. So Lord, we, we set our eyes back on you, your nature, your character. We have every reason to hope. And God, for the pain that's buried alongside that transition that happened from hope into hopelessness, God, would you release healing, healing over hearts, healing over minds, healing over marriages and relationships. just ask you for more Holy Spirit. We 
I ask you for more, Holy Spirit. For some of you, what might be coming up right now is a moment where God didn't show up in the way that you expected him to. That's happened with a lot of us. And what can happen in those moments sometimes is that we, life will happen and we don't have reasons or explanations for it, but our response to what happens can be ungodly. And sometimes what happens in those moments is we shake a fist at God, we, we hold resentment towards him when he's the, the only person who can actually bring us comfort in those moments, that's what he wants to do. For those of you who are identifying with that, just pray through God, I've, I've held this against you. Please forgive me. So Jesus, we look to you. We look to you as the source of our hope. We look to you as the source of our hope, the one who can actually teach us how to stand, have hope, and then move in faith in alignment with that hope. God, we release healing over hearts today. We bless what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.